Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the Where Do We Be In podcast. We've got a special, special edition for you today. This is going to be an absolute cracker. Jackson, what are we focusing on? So it's been a few weeks in the making this episode, but we are focusing on one of the greatest grand finals of all time, AFL, VFL, the 1989 grand final between Geelong and Hawthorne. It was an absolute cracker. We've been, this has been in the making for a while. It's been a lot of work. We've interviewed a few different people. Um, Tony Wilson's the author of a book, 1989, The Great Grand Final. Uh, so we're going to talk to him first. And then after that, we'll chat to two people who are playing the game. Uh, who are they, Jackson? So we're going to be chatting to Barry Stoneham and Andy, Andy Collins. Yeah. So um, Andy Collins, Hawthorne, more than 200 games. Barry Stoneham, same for Geelong. So it should be absolutely great. Um, We've been looking forward to releasing this for ages. Um, it's, it should be really good. So I reckon let's just get straight into it. Let's go. Lots of us will know our next guest for his radio and television career. Fans of the round ball game might be aware of his book, Australia United. And our younger listeners, big shout out to our all our five-year-old fans out there, um, we recognise his unique writing style from literary classics such as The Cow Tripped Over the Moon, Bar Bar Blue Sheep and Hickory Dickory Dash. And Tony Wilson's recently written a book called 1989 The Great Grand Final and that's why we're delighted to have him on the show today. Hi Tony. Oh, g'day, boys. Now, it's a very disparate and weird writing career, isn't it? Stretching from the, the picture book to the, the full-on sporting history, but it's, a, it's, been, it's been joyous. Yeah, it's a bit of a weird little career path you've forged for yourself. But uh, before we get on to the main topic, which is the game, of course, we'll have a little chat about the book. So what strikes me about the book, you've got in big uh, brown and gold writing, 1989, and above that says the great grand final. In your opinion, is it the greatest? Well, do you know that I sent an email to the publisher and said, should this be called the greatest grand final just so that we can get three bad bad segments in on SEN and uh, and people all, all, all ring in and, and complain about it, calling itself the greatest grand final? And... And they and he said no. There's a classiness. This was uh, Jeff Slattery, the publisher at Slattery Media. So no, there's a classiness and a neatness to this phrase, the Great Grand Final. They all know it's the greatest. They can still have their fight on air, uh, but but let's let's not be so bold as to say the greatest. So it was flagged and rejected. It was me who was going to go classless and base, and Jeff Slattery hauled me back with the Great Grand Final. Is there anything that comes close? Any recent ones, in your opinion? Uh, yes, yeah, so there's. I, I don't really think it's a. It is pretty hard to compare grand finals and say definitively this is the greatest. I would have walked out of the Sydney West Coast one after the Leo Barry Mark. I remember just being euphoric. I was tingling after that game. But if you actually can, if you compare it to '89 as an overall piece. I think it struggles to beat it just because of the the weight of scoring in 89 and, and, and sort of the Ablett ends up being a trump card almost against any other grand final to have this freak at the very top of his game doing things that are so mercurial that we remember the, in, the individual incidents years and years later. I mean, I, I think sometimes Buddy does those sorts of things and, and, and they stay with you. But, but, but he did three or four in that 1989 grand final that where any one of them would become legendary. And so um, I think that the Ablett factor probably propels it into a, into a league of its own. But I'm really happy to hear arguments that 1970 is better or 19, uh, 2018, a wonderful game. And, you know, again, one where you're just pinching yourself as you walk out. 2012 shattered at that one as, as a Hawthorne supporter. But, you know, it's a, ga- a game that stands up when you're watching it and the heroics of Adam Goods on one leg. You know, you kind of... Oh, there's so many to pick from, um, but but in terms of the weight of scoring, the individuals involved, the kind of cast of characters, the the like there was actually a revenge drama in three parts with the eight spirit, and you know it sort of had a bit of a Shakespearean element to it, you know, and so I think I'd say that it's very difficult to top for all those reasons, and and personally I say the greatest. So. Obviously, Harper and I, we're pretty young at the moment, so we haven't watched it. I, I've watched it, re- we have watched it recently. Just to see how brutal it was, how does that compare to sort of the grand finals now that we're sort of used to? Well, 
it is really different. I mean, it, it, it was on a path anyway. So my dad played in 1971 grand final and they had one umpire and um, and no trial by video. And so it's all in black and white, but there's just big swinging hooks being thrown, you know. Famously, Cowboy Neil knocking out Peter Hudson, but there's also Mick Porter. There's one that Carl Ditchich goes under from Mick Porter that is a 180-degree swing of a forearm that would would have knocked him senseless. So, you know, it's the sort of stuff, dirty acts that just don't exist in the modern game. And where 1989 is, 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 is it, it's at the cusp of the cleaning up of the game. So trial by video has just come in to the – the AFL or the VFL, uh, and that is making a difference. Uh, there are two umpires, not three, uh, in 1989, and there are nowhere near the number of cameras. And so you're still able to uh, to get away with a fair bit. And in, and in fact, when Platten is knocked out at the end of the first quarter, my argument is that it would be a famous hit by Gary Hocking if it was committed in the modern era. But because it's sort of top of screen, two small figures, you don't really see him get lifted off the ground by a forearm unless you're watching it 30 or 40 times in a row like I did. Um, and you go, wow, that's it. That's why he was knocked out. And even Platt doesn't know it was that. I, I, I've rung him up because he, he thinks it's the one at the 24-minute mark. And I said, no, I think it's the 28-minute mark. You, you, you go up in the air off your feet from a forearm. And, and it's so quick. Uh, and, but that sort of stuff existed in the game. And so, I mean, leaving aside even Yates on Brereton, that couldn't happen today because they've moved the perimeter in for a shepherd to a couple of metres off the ball instead of 10. Can you imagine 10 metres off the ball? You could pick people off. That's like I'm sitting in a room. It's sort of three rooms away. You could still you, – you could, you could take someone out who wasn't watching. <laughs> it was unbelievable. And, and the irony being that Dermot was the one who mainly did that. Um, he was the one who was a prime offender at centre bounces in terms of uh, picking people off. So you had that sort of violence and you also had, and this was articulated to me brilliantly by Gary Ayres, um, you, you also had this hitting players in the head as they were coming up from a crouched position. So um, there's a moment in the first quarter where Ayres runs into Ablett and, and I sort of marvel in the book that that Ablett isn't knocked out because it's such a sweet contact in terms of um, Ayres really connecting with his head. And, and Ablett must have a hard head because he kind of rubs it and gets up and goes on and kicks his nine. But it was uh, – and Ayres told me that that was a tactic discussed with Jeans. Players aren't the most vulnerable when they are coming up from a crouch position um, with the ball in hand. And so these guys like Ayres would accelerate into the head to try to knock people out. And it was a legitimate way of playing footy at the time. Um, the the timed hip and shoulder, which if it got the head incidentally was pretty much play on. So um, that happens without without sort of overstressing the, the terribly dirty acts in 89. So let's count those. You've got um, a, a hit by Hocking on Platten, which is really dirty, and then you've got a horrible hit by Dipper on Hocking, which is really dirty. They're the two big ones. There's one, David Cameron hits Dean Anderson, gets two weeks for it. That was an elbow to the head, pretty dirty. Um, but the Yates one was within the rules of the game on, on Brereton, um, and I, I'm struggling to think of too many others that are out and out dirty punches. So, um, so it wasn't a game that was marred by that. What it was marred by is that the rules allowed for collecting blokes and hitting blokes um, in vulnerable positions. And, and that, was a, that was very much the order of the day. So you mentioned that game being on the cusp of the cleaner type of game we've got now. And um, obviously you had people whacking each other left, right and centre back then, which is, you just don't really see anymore. But you also had a much more – it's really noticeable – how much more free-flowing and um, clear all the space is when watching replays of that game now. So would you say you miss those days of that type of footy? Well, I had a chapter that was called A Beautiful Anachronism and it was quite a, a, a wistful and nostalgic chapter. There are a lot of things that are better about the modern world and, and even some things that are bad about, better about modern footy. I happen to think that having players not get picked off and hit in the head, it's a better game for that. But we definitely miss 
the age-old, 100-year-old tradition in VFL footy for man-on-man um, attack on the ball with contest after contest, small numbers around the contest meant that there was sort of a sense that it would fall one way or the other. It was almost like watching uh, a, 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 toy, a coin toss um, and with that sort of chance at play and with a 360 dimension, 360 degree field, um, footy was an incredible game to watch. It was full of chance um, and it was at this stage, it was when footy was semi-professional. So the skills had improved, that the ball was moving incredibly quickly and the players were fantastic athletes, but the tactics hadn't caught up with their professionalism um, and it was still the old kick it long, there's our centre-half forward, he's one-on-one with his centre-half back. It was just great to watch. I mean, how imagine 40 odd, 42 goals and, and I think it's something like nearly 70 shots at goal in the, in the game um, and no one, no matter what the situations were in that incredible game and, and Hawthorne have uh, six goals, I was seven goals up at one point, um, Geelong, uh, you know, no one thinks to put a, a defensive structure in place. Both coaches go, no, nah, go for it. Let's see how fast we can score. And they don't change from that all day, despite the um, the the the, diff- the, the seesawing nature of uh, of the game. Or at least you'd even think Hawthorne would put the defence into place because you've got a seven goal lead. You want to protect it, right? And you, certainly nowadays, you you wouldn't score easily against a side that's seven goals up. So you mentioned Gary Ablett before. Gary Ablett Senior um, was kicking the nine goals. Do you think that's one of the greatest grand final performances of all time? Oh, it is the greatest grand final performance of all time. It's I've, I've, I've had one of my blokes who bought a book from me. He's emailed me and he, we've been in a discussion that Gary Ablett lost the game for Geelong because he didn't apply defensive pressure. <laughs> so, uh, and it's true, there were actually five kickouts. Geelong kicked points at the start of the third quarter and Chris Langford had moved on to, Langf- uh, on to um, Ablett, a rampaging Ablett, and... And for the for all five kickouts, Langford is involved in the chain of possession. So basically, uh, Langford decided uh, this is a bloke who doesn't really chase or pick up in a tight way, and he's on fire. But one way in which I can hurt him is to run off him, and so that's what he starts doing. And for the first half of the third quarter, Chris Langford is just brilliant. Um, Abbott's pretty good too, but but Chris Langford is fantastic at getting Hawthorne moving and being pretty much the outlet in defence and, and he hits targets too with his feet. So um, it's, a, it's a fantastic quarter that Langford plays um, but that's a ludicrous statement from that bloke that I'm having the email chat with because, you know, what he's doing in an attacking sense is just impossible. Like he's he's kicking goals that are balletic. He, the, from the first one, there's well, there's a regulation out of the – but he gets one at the 40-second mark of the first quarter. His second one, I think, is falling backwards on the boundary line with one hand when, um, you know, just a beautiful mark, just so balanced and poised and then puts through the banana. The third one is the – the miracle, um, the one that will be replayed for the rest of time, which is the pluck out of the ruck. Um, there's a couple of regulation leads out. Um, there's a there's a hang right in the back of John Kennedy. He pushes him forward and out of screen with a screamer. Uh, his eighth goal is just a ridiculous act of balance where he drops the ball with one hand and leads Ablett, uh, Langford under the ball and, and then doubles back, picks it up in the other hand and puts it through on his left. Um, it's, you know, it is just, it is, it is impossibility after impossibility being served up by a guy who is just completely in charge of time and space and in a way that only a genius ever would be. And, and, you know, and I think there've been, I've I've been watching grand finals. I've been to all grand finals except for two since 1981. Um, one I missed. The, I missed the '95 one with a footy trip with the Preston Knights with the Preston Bull Ants Footy Club, and '94 I was in Canada for the Eagles beating Geelong. But they're the only two grand finals I've missed since 1981, and 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 I've never seen anything close to Ablett's nine in terms of a a dominant Norm Smith where you just go it has to be him, you know. So yes. You mentioned your uh, footy career there with the – was it the Preston Bullants that you mentioned? 
All right, yeah, the Preston Bull Ants. Well, the poor old Preston Bull, Bull Ants, it's actually we're just administering the last rites after they died a couple of months ago. So uh, Preston Bull Ants are a 137-year-old club um, and played at Cramer Street in Preston, predate the AFL, just at a – a fantastic club. Um, I went there after I went to Perant. So I played Hawthorne under-19s, Hawthorne Reserves, delisted 1992 at Hawks, uh, went to Perant under Brian Taylor, then a bit of a stint at – I actually had a little go at Essendon at, uh, with a pre-season at Essendon with um, with Kevin Sheedy but didn't get picked up and then um, – and then went back and played Preston in the VFL, VFL and, and then finished in the amateurs with Uni Blacks. That was my footy career. Yeah, um, and obviously you being the only one out of us three being actually alive for that game, just a completely different era. Nowadays you can watch all the games on your TV, on your phone, on your laptop, on whatever, and you can get 24-7, chat about it on the forums, on social media, tune into the radio, but... What was your personal experience of that, I guess, that era and that day and game specifically? Well, of the era, uh, I was uh, 16 years old, so I'll say it was, I was coming to the end of my childhood. I was, I was just becoming an under-19s player at Hawthorne. But my footy-obsessed childhood was filled with the actual Saturday afternoon. Friday nights only came in in the mid-'80s when I was about 12 or 13, and they were pretty special. They were very exciting when they started. But before that, it was just a um, 12-team competition playing six games on a Saturday. And so you'd kind of get – I used to lie on my bed. There was no television coverage. I'd put on the radio and you'd work out which channels had the various games. And I'd often have the team sheets out and I'd almost take my own stats from the – radio <laughs> like that, it's not like there wasn't a statistician at the ground taking the stats but you know I'd like to just say oh kick to Terry Wallace who handles it so I'd, I'd be trying to construct a stat sheet out of the radio broadcast which is pretty <laughs> a pretty shoddy stats sheet and then you know you'd think the games would all finish and you'd always hate that if you were on the racing station that was the worst because you'd or they'd interrupt the actual games to go to horse races so the one game a week was covered by Three years ed. That was always really annoying. Um, and then, and then after the games, the siren would go, and you'd kind of have that lovely kick in the darkness after the footy had finished on Saturday, and the replay would start at six or six thirty or seven. And so you you could watch one or two of the games from the day on the replay, and and the big teams just got favoured. So you know, Carlton and Collingwood and and Hawthorne and Essendon were always on the replay, but you know, people just hardly ever saw Nicky Winmar and Plugger and they just were buried because they weren't getting on the televised games, you know. So um, it was it was a really different feel to being a footy fan back then. And, and in some ways it was so special um, and it all came at once. I don't know if you know that feeling when you're watching a World Cup where all it's just all coming at once. It's like three games a day and you just can't believe how, you know, brilliant it is. Well, one thing I loved about that era was that all the games just dropped on you and you could be you be, could be following two really tight ones at once, you know, and they're all being played at once. So th- that was a different feeling. and It's better now. As a, if you're a footy junkie, you can just, you know, string it out over the whole weekend. So it, it is better now, but but there was there were some really nice bits of the of the old way. So what I noticed watching the replay of the 89 grand final is that the MCG had a smoker's stand. How do you think yeah. sort of that, that's um, sort of, yeah, having a smoker's stand and then now there's like places in the MCG where you can't even have a beer. How's that sort of changed over time? Well, do you know, the, there's so many good little smoking vignettes in my book, the 89 grand final. Um, so when Brereton gets hit by Yates, as I said, Abbott takes a mark at the 12-second mark of the quarter and kicks a goal at the 40-second 40 sec, 40 mark. And um, the the assistant coach sitting next to uh, Malcolm Blight is Greg Wells, I think. Uh, might be another Wells, but it is, it is a uh, Wells. And he says, how'd that other thing go? Because he wasn't watching Yates on Brereton. And Blighty just draws back on his Alpine cigarette. <laughs> 
and says perfect. And that's that's how it's described in the that's how it's described by um, Malcolm and by uh, James Button in his book Comeback, that's a, which is a great book. But you know that idea that the coach is in the coach's box putting away some darts and and uh, and Mark Yates when he was nervously kind of contemplating what he had to do in those first seconds of the grand final, he he goes into the toilet to go to the t- you know to go and have a piss and and. Blight is just sitting on the edge of the bath and there's seven cigarettes around his feet. He's just chain smoking on the side of a bath. He says, how are you going, Yater? And he says, and Yates, he, who is a smoker, says, you know, oh, I could do with one of those, to be honest. He didn't have one <laughs> pre-game. I think they'd uh, got to that point in the health renaissance. But um, uh, it, it is it is just a ridiculous image, a smoker's stand, coaches smoking, um, players wanting a smoke, uh, you know, smoking on buses on the way back to Geelong. It's just crazy, yeah. Yeah, so those um, players that you interviewed, you interviewed all types of people associated with the game, but some of the people on the Hawks side that you interviewed, do you reckon it felt more special for them than it would now because it was one of the final games of that old footy era, I guess? Well, they looking back, I think they feel that. So they wouldn't have known it at the time. At the time, it was just footy. You know, it was the biggest show in town and everyone wanted to win it and they did. And by winning the 1989 Grand Final, they cemented their position as the team of the decade and and they achieved this back-to-back thing that had become an obsession for Alan Jeans in particular. But it was it was painted as the goal for the year and the thing that no other Hawthorne Premiership team had managed to achieve, which was the back-to-back. So at the time it was it was put forward like that. But when I speak to them now, 31 years on and 30 years on, there's no doubt that the status of the game has really, uh, you know, it's left a mark on the players. Like they they really love the fact that they played in this one. Um, I, Chris Whitman said to me, you know. I call it the Woodstock of Grand Finals, you know, and that's that's a great expression, you know, that sense that if you were there, <laughs> you know, it's sort of it's it's got that luster. And in fact, as I said, I'm selling these books, so I get lots of emails from people just saying I'm not Hawthorne, but I was there, and for me, it's just such a memorable day. I, I'd be interested to read it, and um, it does have that kind of universality, and and yeah, so the Hawthorne players in particular feel uh, proud to have been involved. The Geelong players in, in some cases feel very proud and, and say that, you know, um, but I think there's also a, a pain and I got that pain from a few of the people I interviewed or tried to interview. Um, just that sense that they've talked about it a lot. They fell on the wrong side of the ledger and it doesn't really go away. Do you think that, passion sort of came about because it's the last it was the last VFL grand final I don't know I think again that's the sort of thing that was a I think that's the sort of thing that we pick up on now at the time the ba- rebadging of the VFL as the AFL was not really important to the players I was actually at the club at that time and remember whoa look we've got different badges on our jumper you know it was that sort of thing oh they're calling it AFL it was but it was it was no weirder than someone saying instead of it the the Foster's Cup, it's now called the Wizard Cup. You know, it was sort of like a a name change, but the competition remained the same. Um, I think in 1991 we got the Crows, didn't we, as the first year of the Crows? Um, so it might have been 1990 that we got the Crows. If, if if 1990 was the addition of a new team, I think there would have been a feeling that things were becoming more national. Um, and but at that stage, it was an incremental feeling of becoming a national competition. It still felt like a, a Victorian competition, and it was because the Swans hadn't been particularly strong, um, and they were actually going to go into a very weak period in the early nineties. Um, the Crows were either just being born or um, a year away from being born, and West Coast were becoming the strongest side in the comp in nineteen ninety one. But it was really their arrival that said. Hey, we're in, we're now a national sport. It's it is an AFL, not a VFL. Uh, but I, I remember thinking because we were still that six day game on Saturday kind of feel to the competition. Um, you still it wasn't that different to 1985. Hawthorne clearly the dominant team of the 80s, winning 
four grand finals and Geelong uh, not having won a premiership for like 20 years? What, what was it? 23 years? Yeah, 63. So they'd won in 63. They'd lost in 67, very unluckily. Um, some people think there was a mark taken behind the line or something. Fred Swift, I'm the, I can't give you the details. I'm sure any Geelong fan could, though. Um, Richmond won that one in 67. So they hadn't been in the grand final for 23 years at the time and they hadn't won one for 27 years. So it had been a long draft, dr- sorry, a long drought and the, it had also been quite a brutal drought in the 70s. They were pretty lamentable and then – a, a little bit of a glimmer of hope in the early 80s with, I think, a preliminary final in 81. But they were basically ordinary until uh, Blight and 89. So did anyone give the Cats a chance in the 89 grand final? Oh, I think they were given a chance because they were such a heavy scoring team. So there was one point in the year, um, I call it in the, in the book, I call it the streak. They, they kicked 30 goals three weeks in a row they go on a winning streak of seven or eight games. And in that streak, like they, they're second on the ladder to Hawthorne and they beat Essendon or Melbourne in a glue pot at the MCG, 11 goals to two. You know, they're, they're smashing sides. Um, by they, Their percentage was 30% higher than Hawthorne's percentage mid-season. So they kind of were very exciting. They had firepower all over the place. They were tough. They had future Hall of Famers in Hawking. And and Gary Abel, as I said when you were asking the grand final question as to why it's the most special grand final, he's he's about to construct really the most special and spectacular and weirdly talented career that's ever been played. I mean, you can debate who's the best player of all time in, in all sorts of ways. He's, he's not the best player of all time, but he's the most compelling player of all time. He just could do anything and, and was doing anything. So, um, you know, so in those weeks, there was a sense that this team is something special. They are so attacking. They score so fast. They can win from anywhere. And so right through the grand final, all the Hawthorne players, despite their large leads, and they led by 36 points at quarter time and I think it was out to 40 at half time or something like that and maybe even 39 at three quarter time it was a it's six goals basically a lead at each of the breaks in the grand final but there was always a sense especially with the injuries that were mounting up that this Geelong team could go bang 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 and they really did you think of the last quarter of the grand final everyone says oh Geelong couldn't win it was nine minutes to go when they were back to within 11 points. So they've gone from 37 or 30, 36 or 36 points down at three-quarter time. And in the modern era, you'd probably go, no, that, that's enough, or one more and it's enough. But they not only nearly make – they nearly make it up in, nine, in 19 minutes. You know, they're just scoring so fast. And, um, and no defensive structures going into place from Hawthorne to protect that lead which again is what we're talking about, about the different era and the lack of coaching sort of now, so I guess. Um, and, and so, yeah, they were, they were definitely a chance to win. There's no doubt Hawthorne were the best team. They lost six games over two years. They won back-to-back premierships. They've got nine Hall of Fame players compared to two from Geelong. Uh, they're, they're, they were a better team. But, uh, but on the day, as proven and as history showed, Geelong were right in it and got, got, the, got, got to within six. So watching a, uh, watching a documentary about the game and the build-up and all the sort of revenge stories, the Hawthorne, all the Hawthorne players were basically saying that if there was five minutes left, Geelong probably would have had it and there was just so much relief at the final siren do you think that if there was five minutes left, Geelong would have got the ball up to Gary Ablin and he would have snagged his 10th? Well, it's, it's very hard to do those what ifs. But the, um, do you know that I spoke to a few people. So John Kennedy said to me flat out, yeah, I think we were gone. I think we were wobbling and they had us on the ropes and we were raining knockout blows. And it's true that Hawthorne's last goal was the 21-minute mark of the last quarter and it was Dean Anderson, I think, who kicked it. So um, there's... There's a long period of time where the only team that's scoring or really looks like scoring is Geelong. But um, Peter Curran said to me, no, we had him. There was a moment where I felt the momentum turn. I think we were going to score the next one. (laughs) So he he went against that 
because that is a very often repeated phrase and, and Peter Curran disagreed strongly with it. He said, I, I felt like we had seized back a bit of initiative. Uh, but John Kennedy said, I think we were gone. Um, Depo was, you know, had his, he wouldn't have lasted another five minutes, I don't think. Tucky had split webbing. Um, Geelong were wounded as well. But I, I think that you'd have to say Geelong would win in, in five more minutes. So... Geelong kicked that goal close to the end to bring it back to six points. And then there was a centre bounce and there was uh, a bit of um, a stoppage, I guess, or it was a bit clogged up in the middle. And then you see uh, the, the scoreboard uh, in the top left. It says like 10 seconds left or something like that. Nowadays, you'd think, oh, yeah, they'll ball it up and there'll be a chance for the Cats to get it down because the clock stops. But in those days, of course, the clock didn't stop for ball, balls up and stuff like that. Um, but I guess moving on from that, I have to ask what uh, what motivated you to write the book. So I was asked to actually. I, I was I wrote a piece in 1999 on the 10 year anniversary of the game, and it was a well received piece in the Age. And I know that um, Jeff Slattery was writing a series. Sorry, he was. Um, I'll just say that again. Can you do a cut? Yeah. No. So, yeah, no yep, Jeff. Jeff Slattery, who published this book, um, he was making a series called Sports Shorts and he was doing a 30,000, 40,000 word essays about individuals or events, famous uh, – there's one about the meeting between Kerry Packer and Don Bradman during the frack hour of World Series cricket and that was written by Daniel Brettig and there's another one by Gideon Haig about the ball tampering series um, and and so basically I thought, oh, yeah, I can do that. I'd love to do that. You know, I'd get to revisit these heroes of my childhood and I love the game. I've written about the game before. Um, I'm going to have a crack at it. So it actually wasn't my initiative to get out there and write this book. It was Jeff Slattery's idea to do it. And um, and then I embarked upon it and it was just a really fulfilling and fun project. Went around with my Zoom recorder and got beautiful interviews with um, you know up to nearly 20 uh, players and coaches from that day. And so – um, you know, I sort of got pretty excited actually and, and what I handed in wasn't 35,000 words, it was 55,000 words and Jeff read it and went, you know, this is really good. I'm not going to I'm not going to lop you down 20,000. I'm going to boost you out to a C format, paperback, put in some glossy photos, make this a standalone, and your book's no longer part of sports shorts. It's called 1989, The Great Grand Final. And no, Tony, you can't call it the greatest grand final because that would be tacky and, and crass. Yeah. So how many times have you watched the game? Oh, I, don't know. I reckon I've seen it 60 times. Um, so in the course of writing it, I reckon I watched it 20 times and um, I've probably watched it 40 times. I always think I watch it about once a year where I choose to and what are we up to, 30 years. And and uh, there were times where I watch it where it's on as well. So, you know, like if, it, if it's on the footy marathon or if it's my brother's watching it or if um, a Hawthorne supporter comes around and he goes, hey, do you want to put it on? So I, I reckon I'm going to guess 60 times I've watched it. <laughs> I know the commentary off by heart. You know, pressure, Ian, pressure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, 1989, the great grand final. You can get it from all your favourite bookstores and uh, on Tony's website, tonywilson.com.au, and you can get a signed copy for just 35 bucks, including postage. And I believe we're also giving one away if you can answer this question that Tony's got for you. Uh, what's the question, Tony? Who kicked Hawthorne's last goal of the 89 grand final? Um, it was at the city end and uh, he was a Caulfield grammar boy. <laughs> it's pretty obvious. But Hawthorne fans will get it. But um, he's been a great help to me too with this book. So I'm, I'm feeling very, uh, very warm towards him um, and so if you if you send me an email to tony at tonywilson.com.au and you're the first one put the answer in the subject line and send me your address I'll post you the book but uh, I, I've only got one freebie to give away otherwise it's a it's a $35 hit 
Well, it sounds like the door's absolutely being pounded down out there. I think that might be our next two guests. So I think we'll have to say goodbye to you, Tony Wilson, and lead in these next guests before our door breaks and say hello to them. They've been begging to come on for a long, long time. And the Where Do We Begin podcast selection committee has decided to let them on very generously of them. Uh, so I guess we've got to give a big welcome to a couple of players who played in that game in the studio. We've got Andy Collins, the Hawthorne great, three-time premiership player, and we've got the Geelong centre-half forward of the day and another great of footy, Barry Stoneham. Welcome, guys. Thank you. It's it's good to be here. Thanks, guys. Yeah, so uh, obviously talking about the 89 grand final, uh, I differing memories for the both of you. Uh had a great chat to Tony Wilson uh, just before, but I think we'll just get started in terms of the pre-game, the kind of hype around it. Um, So what were your uh, experiences of like grand final week, I guess? Yeah. um, For us, you know, we, we'd now played 87. We lost 87 against Carlton. Um, Then, then we had a really resounding victory in 88 against Melbourne and, um, you know, we were, we were still a pretty good team in 89 and, you know, I think that we were probably the best home and away team, um, but we knew Geelong were coming and we knew it was going to be a great grand final. What about you, Barry? Yeah, well, it was from our side of things. I, I think uh, Andy understated the Hawthorne team by saying they were a pretty good team. They were a fantastic team. They were <clears throat> a star-studded lineup uh, throughout the whole whole team in, in a year. Ours was obviously a bit different because – 89 for us in the week before the grand final was all completely new for the team. So we hadn't been in the finals <coughs> at, at all for, since about 1981, which obviously a lot of our players weren't playing back then. So 1989 was a, a new year for us with a new coach, Malcolm Blight. Um, we hadn't been in the finals at all from our career. It was my fourth year at the club. So we started off our finals campaign very poorly against Essendon in the uh, qualifying final. Lost by, gee, I couldn't see the moment, probably 70 or 80 points. And then we had semi final against Melbourne, which we won convincingly, and then played Essendon in the end, the prelim final, and won probably the same sort of margin. So our grand final week started with the Brownlow medal night when Paul Couch, a great mate of ours, and unfortunately who passed away about four years ago, won the Brownlow medal on the Monday night. So that started off a fantastic week for us. There's a lot of hype, as you'd expect, in uh, Geelong Town. Not been in the grand final for well, since 1963, so it was very exciting. And we had crowds of people, like 10,000 people, watching the training, and and the hype was there. So it was certainly an exciting, exciting week for us. So Andy, how seriously were Geelong taken for you guys? Yeah, we we'd played them earlier in the year, and if I remember the game, Barry, I think it was Princess Park, and uh, there was a. Mm a really significant um, halftime lead that Geelong had um, and they totally outplayed us. Um, it was also, you know, it turned our game around and we had this amazing comeback. We we still talk about it as a group, you know, that that was a really significant game for us uh, to come back that margin. Um, but we, we knew from that encounter that Geelong were going to be a legitimate threat um, for us, and you know, in in some ways, it may have even been um, the best and the worst of matchups for us, because the confidence of the the group uh, of the Geelong players and Barry, Gary, you know, Billy and and Buddha we just mentioned um, off air, you know, they, they were an amazing group of players. They were starting to reach their their peak as as players, and uh, we really really did hold them in high regard. Do you think the hype, Barry, around the game was a bit bigger because of there was a bit of a rivalry and Geelong's got that kind of country boy reputation, whereas Hawthorne, they're the experienced guys. They've been in grand finals before, the private school kind of reputation. Does that make the rivalry bigger, do you think? Um, the other thing, certainly the hype was probably, I mean, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure how the Hawthorne hype was. They seem to be obviously a lot more experienced um, in the finals over those years before 89 very experienced players, um, solid. They'd been there before. They knew what to do. Whereas I suppose you're right, we were sort of <clears throat> one one team, one town in Geelong. Hadn't been there for many years, as I said earlier on. And the height was, was large. It was like so exciting wherever you walked around the town. Um, people would talk about it. So you couldn't help but get excited. And I'd, I'd assume, obviously, being a club in Melbourne, you can certainly 
people would talk about it. But you can also probably avoid that if you needed to, whereas in Geelong, to go to the milk bar or, or go and get a paper or get some petrol, that's all people would speak about. So I think the hype, in hindsight, I suppose, when you look at the game as well, especially the start of the game, in the first quarter in particular, the hype may have got to us to an extent. Now, I'm not saying it did, but we were pretty excited. We probably gave away certain free kicks in the first quarter we, we shouldn't have. And that all came down to experience in the end. But, you know, it was one of those things. We were, I said, I was 21. A lot of the guys like Billy and, and as Andy mentioned, uh, Gary Hocking and Robert Scott and a lot of these guys were all the same age. So we were, we were very young and fresh and jumping out of our skin. So when you weigh it up and you look back 30, what, 31 years ago, which is extraordinary in itself, um, that, yeah, we probably, if we kept the lid on it a bit more, it may have been better, but you just never know at that time, right at the time. So, Barry, there before the game, there was an incident with you and Billy Brownless with a garbage truck. Can you uh, indulge into <laughs> <up to> that? <laughs> um, yeah, well, that's something we're not proud of, although Billy talks about it all the time, which I wish he didn't <laughs> because uh, as he gets older and wiser and uh, when he does bring it up in front of officially Geelong supporters who were hurting after we lost, I mean, he brings it up in his sport. He's nice. We, look, I'll, uh, the truth was we – but I had a big win in the prelim at a VFL Park against the Bombers. Um, again, very excited. I, was, I had a great game. I was happy with mine. We are all pumped up. And my local footy club, St Joey's, won the premiership the same day in July. So I thought I'd do the right thing and go down and sort of wish them well uh, when we got back to Geelong and had a couple of quiet ales and so forth. And Billy came with me, as we did back then. And... We probably got a little bit excited talking about hype um, that night, a week before, and we had a bit of a night out. And um, as Billy will attest to, uh, we did get a lift home a little bit later in the night by uh, a garbage truck um, as we were walking home. So not great preparation a week later. I, I do recall when, because obviously Gary Ayres, a great Gary Ayres, was a, who played in that grand final, also coached me in Geelong in the 90s. And we did speak about it um, years, years later uh, after the training one night and sort of said, how was Hawthorne preparation? Or oh, sorry, the night before, a week before, what were you doing the Saturday night beforehand? And he said, obviously, they were all tucked up in bed in early nights. And uh, I thought to myself, gee, here's another one, another regret. You think, well, 21, pretty silly, um, silly judgment. If you only had been in bed a bit earlier, again, you never know. But these things you live and learn as you go along. But um, yeah, not proud of that moment, I must admit. So, Barry, your first grand final, but Andy, a bit more experience, your third in your third year. Does that ease the nerves, make the nervousness a bit less uh, before the game? Yeah, definitely. You know, experience, I think, in uh, grand finals, of running out in front of 100,000, you know, my very first grand final uh, against Carlton, um, it took me a little while to get my breath you know, and to get my focus. Now, um, you know, being, being your first grand final, that was the way I'd, I felt. Now, it took me probably 10 to 15 minutes to work into the game uh, and I was still relatively inexperienced. That was my first year of footy. I'd only played nine or ten games at that stage. Um, by my third grand final, I must admit, you know, that I, I went out very relaxed, very confident that this was a game of footy that we needed to play to the best of our ability. We knew we were playing a dangerous opponent. We were always respectful and, and it was game on. And we, we had played grand finals. We played in really physical ones. Um, so we we're ready for everything that may have occurred. And, you know, from a personal perspective, and I know that probably I, I also speak for many of the teammates that had played, that's a nice thing to have. And, I, um, and I'm sure that, you know, Barry would attest to that. I think that some of the Geelong players, um, and you can see that, were probably over-aroused um, mm. and, you know, and but once they settled down, oh, wow, did they play some, you know, as a footy team, Geelong played some great footy. Yeah, so Barry, how are your feelings before the game? Yeah, I think Andy described it pretty well. Um, really pumped up. I mean, certainly really confident. We, we went into the game very confident, obviously realising how good Hawthorne were and had been over those years and just their, the champions they had on each line. So we were certainly aware of that, there's no doubt. But I think we went in with a lot of confidence because we had a good year 
apart from that sort of the first qualifying final where we had a real blimp and didn't play well at all. But the next two games, we were playing really good attacking footy and won by big margins. And, yeah, we were really uh, pumped up about it and went in with sort of a no-care attitude in a way because because we hadn't been there before, we sort of nothing to lose. You know, we we didn't know really what, what, it, what it would be like. And, and then he said, you're running out in front of 100,000 people. You've got the whole town behind you. You know, it's grand final day. Uh, the atmosphere was amazing. It was a beautiful day weather-wise, what I recall. So you couldn't help but be overly excited. And personally, I was sort of that player, especially in the first half of my career where I got, I didn't get really excited before a game. I got really wound up. Um, you know, you probably sometimes nearly play half a quarter in the rooms before you get out there. Uh, and this is no different because you get out and run onto the ground and all of a sudden the adrenaline really starts to pump. So, And I think, again, Andy was probably right that we were probably a little bit over aroused or over anxious at the start of the game, maybe. Um, and that's due to an experience because we sort of uh, got that pumped up and we, we knew what, what, what had to be done. But the old heads of Hawthorne, as far as experience went, uh, really showed the way. And when we sort of calmed down a bit, uh, having said that, we were six goals down at half time, uh, it was a long way back. But uh, we sort of, I, know, I remember at quarter time, Malcolm sort of saying, OK, put that quarter behind you, let's start again and slowly and surely creep back into the game and uh, we slowly but surely did but not quite so Barry those old experience at heads at Hawthorne I'm assuming was the main reason that um, Malcolm Blight wanted you guys to rough him up a bit for uh, especially the start of the game was there any like hesitance to like might have been thinking oh I might end someone's career here or was it all like part of the cause no no, there wasn't and look honestly obviously it's, it's well um well publicised now with the with the Yatesy and Dermot Burton situation, which was, you know, it was certainly planned beforehand to try and obviously uh, have, have, a, have a bump, have a go at Dermot. And, but other than that, there was no um, direction from the coach to go out and say, let's go harder than man more than usual. <clears throat> because to be honest with you, when you look at the, the matchups and the, and the two teams, we weren't like a big bruising football club. We, we played an attacking soul and a bit of an attacking flair of a game. And Hawthorne were probably – they were stronger, I think, physically. They were bigger bodies. And they had some guys who could really hurt us. So we didn't, we certainly didn't make an intention of going out there saying, right, hey, we're going to go through this man and that man because uh, we certainly had the, the Yatesy and Durham situation, um, which is, you know, it's, it's sort of folklore. But other than that, a lot of the stuff, like head-high tackles and – indiscretions that we shouldn't have done weren't directed by the coach. It was just some of us or whoever it might have been probably just going about it the wrong way and uh, and learning from your mistakes. Even throughout the game, you learn by your mistakes. So if you had the time over again, you'd probably start the game differently um, as far as not going for the man as much, downfield, free kicks and so forth, which really cost us the game. So Andy, how did you feel when one of your talismans, Dermot Burton, was knocked down right at the start of the game? Well, from from where I was, which was pretty deep down the line, and Robert Scott was probably clearing the path for Gary Ablett, and so it was probably Barry and and Billy. We all gave uh, Langers and Ablett probably inside uh, fifty. Uh, we we had experienced um, injuries before, and uh, when Dermot went down, um, and no matter how talented he is, you know it's it's still game on, you know, and that day, um, you know, it's legendary that Dermot goes back up and played a pretty strong game. But, you know, John Platten, uh, who arguably was one of the best midfielders going around footy at that time, is out of the game at a very early stage. You know, Dipper is compromised in the game. Um, so it was really the tally of injuries rather than the individual. So when Dermot went down, you know, it, it's kind of just game on, you know, and, and we've played really good games without superstars and we know that that will occur and we anticipate that. And that, that was the beauty of that group, you know. Younger players could come in and play big game footy because we had such a uh, evenness from 30-year-olds down to 20-year-olds and uh, it was lovely and calming to have such experienced players. Like Dermot is a five-time premiership player Um you know, those sort of things and Dipper and so that that's really calming for a younger player 
um, like myself or Pridge. Um, you know, Dean Anderson had a great game in yeah. 89 grand final. Darren Pritchard had a, an awesome game in, in the 89 grand final. So it's lovely and calming. So Dermot going down, um, you know, it's just game on. And Dermot going up, well, he's just showboating. <laughs> Andy, do you think if uh, Geelong hadn't roughed you up so much at the start and obviously big injuries to Dermy and Dipper and um, John Platten, do you think you would have gone on to win the game if they had have all gone off or if they hadn't been roughed up at all? Oh, it, it's really hard. Like, you know, and, and Barry will no, like uh, you had a really talented team, didn't you, Barry? And Hawthorne and yeah. Geelong had played um, in the home and away game enough to go, we're, we're pretty evenly matched, you know. Um, and there was some young really good Geelong emerging players and Barry's one of those and, you know, Gary Hocking and, we, you know, Couchy won at Nablet were probably, um, you know, Gary was were, were more older. Um, but, mm. you know, the teams were pretty evenly matched and we might have finished high on the ladder but we, we had enormous respect for the danger of this team and this, this team, you know, Geelong, Barry's team, was incredibly high scoring, fast and offensive. And you listen to Malcolm talk about the way he wants footy to be played. And that's why I believe what makes the game so special. Like both teams kicked over 20 goals that day. Like that's amazing footy. Combine that with the physicality of the game that was the moment. Um, so, you know, they, they're all part of the folklore of the game. And that, that's why we're talking even about it now. Because even looking back, and uh, and we we've seen the game as a as a playing group. We we admire every Geelong player. Like you heard me talking to Barry off air. Like he's a brother to me, you know. And I haven't seen him for a long time, but I I have absolutely love and respect for for Barry Stoneham. And Hawthorne players will talk like that about their Geelong players. And luckily, you know, we're really strong teams, and we played a lot of state footy as teammates. Um, yeah. And that respect is built even further, which was great. So, Barry, in your team, you had a bit of a huge trump card being Gary Ablett Senior. How important was he to you guys that day? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, he was an amazing player. Um, he, he, in a lot of conversations, even to this day, and quite often, to be honest with you, people always ask about the great man and uh, how good he really was and was he the best player that I, I had seen and for me, he certainly he was and is. Um, I suppose I saw him firsthand for 10 years. But on that day, I was talking to someone not long ago. It might have been at Triple M had a, a feature about this same game not long ago. Gazza on that day, the 89 grand final, let alone the final series, but that day in itself, nine goals and a Norm Smith. But every goal he got was different. And he probably showcased every skill of Aussie Rules footy in four quarters because he'd, he'd take a big hanger and go back for a set shot. He'd kick a left foot snap. He'd do a banana kick. He'd kick a ball out of the ruck from the boundary throwing. He'd do everything. And, you know, for a guy who um, you know, had a lot of focus on him uh, and he was, he was strong and tough as well, he was one of those guys you wouldn't mess with, but he had every skill and attribute and power that you'd want him to play. So he was certainly a trump card you know, nine goals on a Norman Smith is extraordinary in a losing team. Um, Billy always says, you know, there's 11 goals between the two of them. And why didn't he get one more? He'd body one that would win the game for us. But um, he, look, he, he was a, an amazing player. And I think that final series, I'm not sure exactly the tally he kicked, but it would have been mid-20s in four games, if not more. And he was at the height of his career. He more or less went to full forward not long. That was probably either the first he went to full forward when Malcolm put him down there. Um, and he started off over the first goal of the game and um, didn't look back. So, you know, you sort of – and again, the, the Hawthorne grand final is one of them, but we lost four grand finals in seven years. And you sort of think to have a player of that calibre and not win one is, is wrong. But we just went good enough in the end. So, Andy, how much – uh, focus would you put on Gary Ablett in, in a game like this? Yeah, enormous. Geelong structurally were difficult for us because you've got Barry and Billy that are, you know, big men, you know, tall men. Um, so we our structure was really Chris Mew, 
you know, Chris Langford, you know, as our tool, two tools. And, and so, therefore, who was going to play on Gary? And so, Chris, if Chris Langford then goes to Gary, then who goes to the two tools? And, you know, we, Geelong were an awkward matchup. Um, for us, and, uh, and I think uh, Scott McGuinness started on Gary that day, um, and quickly, you know, as as Gary got going, um, obviously the matchup changed to our number one defender, which was was Chris. And for everything that Gary was like, Chris Langford, if you look back, he had a great game too. And mm-hmm. uh, um, and the beauty of perhaps on that day, you know, that Barry. And, and Billy and Robert, who had also had terrific final series, all three of them, had in the end were playing a bit higher and, and you know, it, it may have worked to our advantage in the end as Geelong got on top, but the scoring source um, was very focused around Gary. And, uh, but he was so good and we didn't think that he, would, he could be so yeah. good on, on yeah. that any given day in September, I remember Peter Curran saying, well, even when he's out right at his best, he's not that accurate in front of goals. Well, he was. And, and, <laughs> and, and, we, and we joke about all these things, but, um, you know, I agree with everything that Barry said. We all that saw him play would say he, he is the best player that we have seen play. And, uh, and for, he was an absolute football genius. He might not be able to articulate that and why made, what made him so good. But, you know, whenever people talk about it and those that saw him play, and particularly that game, if you just look at his highlights, you know, he, I don't think we've seen anyone like it. Anyone that tries to be compared to him, um, I just laugh at, you know. <laughs> and Andy, um, Gary was at the Hawks for a bit. You didn't play with him, but you would have played with a few players who did. Did they help give any insight in to his little tricks and stuff like that? Not at all. Um, it, it's quite legendary that he was never regularly attending training um, and, uh, and that was one of the reasons that, that Alan Jeans and the Hawthorne Match Committee didn't think it was such a, a strong cultural fit at the time. Um, remember his older brothers, Jeff, is a is a 200 plus gamer at Hawthorne and Premiership player. Um, his other older brother Kevin was also a, a really good Hawthorne footballer. Um, so the Ablett family, and obviously through Michael Tuck marrying Faye Ablett, um, you know that that's a really strong connection. Uh, but uh, Gary in his teenage years, and if you're interviewing Gary, um, and we'd all love that interview, you know he he was uh, a bit mischievous and. Uh, and I think that was a great learning curve and, and we saw maybe the, the measurement of the player that he was, you know, to become because of the lessons maybe that he learned through his teenage years at Hawthorne. So, Barry, you guys were down at by 39 points at half time. Going into the rooms, what was the feeling? How, what did Malcolm say? How did you try and get up from that? Yeah, look, it's, it was one of those things because we arrived from the first quarter and the second quarter had uh, margins and both breaks weren't much, weren't very dissimilar. Um, though, so at quarter time, we were sort of shell-shocked and then we thought we sort of uh, held our own in the second quarter and came back and calmed down and sort of each inch in our way back into the game, but the margin was still a long way out. But we, we still felt positive because we had improved from the first quarter. We were playing better football and we're getting a bit of a score on the board. So we went into the halftime break still confident, which when you sort of say, well, you're 39 points down at halftime in a grand final against Hawthorne, who won the year before as well, you would nearly think the game's done. But as a player, you never think that for one thing. Um, and we knew – we sort of knew that the style of game we played, and, and Andy alluded to this a bit earlier, that uh, whether it be right or wrong, we, we had a really attacking game of footy. And we knew if we got on a run – for 15, 20, 25 minutes, we could kick a lot of goals quickly. So Malcolm certainly was still very positive and confident. He had, he had the confidence in the whole group that got us all the way through the year to this stage to say, well, back your game in and keep playing the way you've played all year because if you try to start changing now, well, you you won't be able to get back into the game. So to, to give for him to give us that confidence and the positivity 
um, was was a big thing for us because if you get in at half time and the coach berates you, that won't help. You got to be keep your keep your head. And it was true because we thought, well, yeah, you're right. We might have a six or eight goal quarter and get back into the game because we were, we were fresh, we were young. Well, not all of us, but a pretty young group. We were fit. And once again, back to what I said earlier, there was nothing to lose. And uh, we, were, we were confident we could still have a chance in the game, although it was still a, a mighty mountain to climb. But, you know, we, we, we came out in the third quarter and uh, I think that sort of a couple of early results – uh, as far as goals went, gave us the confidence again. And, and Andy and mentioned before a couple of players, and uh, Dean Anderson, Darren Pritchard, and also James Morrissey. Remember these three guys, when we got closer, we might get four goals behind. All of a sudden, one of those two or three would get a goal or two. And out of the go again, to six goals. So we get close, and then all of a sudden, hang on, pull us back a bit. But we knew we were, we were close enough to try and break that hold. Barry, just at the start, or pretty close to the start of the second quarter, um, you're 39 points down, I think, and uh, you have a set shot about 10 metres out and you miss the original kick <laughs> and then you get a retake. So what was that feeling of like you must have been shitting yourself when you originally missed it, but then how lucky did you feel to get the retake, I guess? Yeah, well, you're right on both accounts there. Um, first time, and it was very close in, as you know, it took the mark. And I haven't watched the game a lot, but obviously I know the time and the shot at goal. And I must admit, I was I thought I'd got it, um, but it was only about five or ten metres out on an angle, which you never should miss those. But when I when it actually when it missed, and I thought, oh my god, I must sort of hammer it up in the head. And even more so when the umpire said, "Have another kick." Well, I was very fortunate to to, to have one, so I couldn't miss two in a row. Because if I did, you know, on a grand final day when you're that far behind and you, you're up, the eyes of nearly Australia, was certainly in Geelong, are on you, you had to get it. So it was a bit, it was a bit an anxious time. I mean, not when, when you think back over the game, it was just to make sure you, you made the most of your second opportunity because uh, they're hard to get, that's for sure. I, I played on Chris Mew, and he's one of the hardest opponents I've ever played on. Always, he always, most of the time I played on him against Hawthorne in the early days. And he was a very hard player to get a kick on, let alone a goal. So when you had the opportunity to have a go at one and get one, you had to make the most of it. And luckily the umpire was on my side at that time. So I luckily got my first. So Andy, even after halftime, you guys scored six goals, but do you think there was a bit of complacency after halftime being that high up? Well, our rooms were really different. And and if you've had uh, Tony on and, you know, talking about his book, um, that we were a little bit of a medical room. Um, you know, obviously we, we – I think we had already lost uh, Gary Ayres and, and John Platten for the day by then. Um, you know, Dipper, you know, was in a really bad way. Dermot was in a bad way, both both with rib injuries um, and we, we now know that Dipper's was a lot worse than that. Um, and then a couple other players, you know, had carried injuries into the game. So, you know, you can imagine there was quite a few more people in the medical room than there was in the, the change room. So if you looked around uh, at each other, it may not have been the same positive uh, vibe. And so that's when Alan Jeans, you know, addressed us, brought us in together and delivered arguably one of the great halftime speeches of all time about there is a price to pay, there is no tomorrow, our bodies will recover, and and it is our time. And we understood um, that at that particular time, and we were not in the in in a, a way in a physical way to play right at our best as a collective, if you like, and. Uh, we weren't in a survival mode and, and Barry mentioned the players. Like, you know, it was just a, a great time for younger players to really stand up and th- that's what the third quarter was about. You know, if you if you look back at both teams, it's it's just a, a glorious battle of, of attacking footy going back and forth and, you know, and every goal we kicked, unfortunately, you know, Geelong were go, sort of getting that too, you know, but... You know, that, that third quarter is still a, a really exciting quarter to watch. And, um, you know, I, I don't ever think complacency got in our team at all. 
How much did going back-to-back feature in the halftime team talk or just in the lead-up to the game in general? Definitely in the lead-up that Hawthorne, for all the grand finals that it had played in in the 80s, had never achieved back-to-back. And a a little part of the story um, that he's missed about the back-to-back is, you know, um, Alan Jeans didn't coach in 1988. Um, Alan Joyce coached. Uh, because Alan Jeans was ill um, after uh, 1987 grand final. Um, I think if he had some bleeding on the brain. And um, so it was a really driven thing for Alan Jeans to achieve. For all the great things, he, he was never able to coach the team in the back-to-back. So, and personally, you know, as a Hawthorne fanatic and growing up, I'm, I'm a big Hawthorne fan. Hawthorne hadn't achieved that. And uh, for all the grand finals, this was going to be a really special grand final team. And if I could be in that and, and so many of the other players in back-to-back, that's a special group. And, and you know, that 88-89 bond of, of Hawthorne players is really close because of that back-to-back um, and being the first Hawthorne team to achieve that. Uh, Barry, was it mentioned a lot to you guys maybe potentially breaking that back-to-back streak? Um, it probably wasn't mentioned as far as back to back too much. Uh, obviously, we just wanted to beat Hawthorne and beat whoever we played against. And we, we knew of, we knew their record. There was seven. Was it seven grand finals in a row? Um, so we, yeah, we knew exactly what they were like. And again, that, that game at Princess Park in the middle of the year, when I think we were ten goals up at half time and lost the game. So we knew how strong they were. So it wasn't about no. We mentioned in the back to back. Because everyone were aware of it, was aware of it. So it was, you know, it was Hawthorne had been uh, a bit of a nemesis for us even before 89, a few times in the 80s. And, and it's amazing even now that's all about the rivalry of Geelong Hawthorne in the present day. That's, that stemmed back from in the 80s, in my belief, because there was a couple of games we should, we should have won in 87 that Hawthorne beat us and just over the line. So we knew exactly what we were getting ourselves in for. Um, and as I said, the like the Andy Collins and um, Chris Langford and Gary Ayers and Chris Mew and Dermot and Dunstall and these guys, they were some of the best players ever to play football. So it was uh, – and when you, when you look back on it and in hindsight, it was – you don't – I think at the time when you're younger, you, you probably take it for granted a bit because you think, oh, it's always next year, we'll do it again next year. But when you retire and you're a fair way out of the game, you do look back and you think, wow, we were very lucky and privileged to get that far and play against that sort of team. Because they were one of the superpowers, uh, Hawthorne, of VFL, AFL, and one of the best teams ever, I think, to play the game. So we didn't, didn't have to mention the back-to-backs. We just, we just knew exactly who we were playing against and we, were, we thought we were ready for them um, as best we could be. Andy, you mentioned before in the second half, it was like for every goal you kicked, the Cats were kicking two. Did it feel as if just, oh, my God, we can't stop this? Like they might be on for a win here. No, and, and we were – we were taught just to keep going. Like, uh, you know, we, we had this um, catch cry that, you know, we would never, well, our philosophy was we never lose a game, we just run out of time. So, again, you know, for everything that Geelong were attacking and, and dishing to us, the only way that we felt that we, we could defend it was to attack. And, and so we were going for it. And um, and the and that's what makes the game so special that and it holds up today. If you watch the game, that it, it just goes and both teams are attacking each other. And what happened was that we made a series of mistakes, critical turnovers. There was a couple of uh, free kicks that maybe went Geelong's way. The extra kick that Barry gets and and others, you know, and uh, but. You know, we we didn't stop, and, and that's always been Hawthorne's philosophy. You, you could have any Hawthorne player in of that era, and we we don't feel like we think like that. And here I am, all these years on, and I'm sort of saying, no, we we kind of didn't think ever like that. You know, we just go at them, and th- that was the beauty of footy in those days. You know, that it was not really about the defensive nature of the game. And if you didn't have a strong attacking game, you couldn't win games of footy. Um, And, you know, that's what probably made it so exciting for the fans. So, Barry, it's been mentioned in other podcasts and 
documentaries about the game and the season that you guys were just all out attack. How much did that help you during the season and up to this game? Uh, yeah, look, it's certainly, yeah, it's, again, it's one of those things. We were very, a very attacking team and it, it, obviously it was a great way to play football, there's no doubt, especially being a forward player. Most of my career was, uh, it was a great way to play and Malcolm's philosophy was if uh, they get 20 goals, we get 21, we win the game, which, you know, which holds up pretty well most of the time. But I think, again, looking back, and this is a, it's by no means about any of our players, it's actually about our actual team and club itself. Our defensive mode wasn't what it should have been, and that doesn't mean defenders, it means everyone, it means on balls, it means forward players. If we had improved our defensive part of the game – we might have snared one of those four grand finals because, yeah, we tick goals. 89 was a massive year for us as far as – I think I'm not quite sure of the stat, but we've got 20 goals, like 11 games of the year, and we kicked the highest score ever and still stands in 89, 37 goals. So it was a really exciting time. It was, it was really enjoyable football. But when it comes down to the nitty-gritty and you're playing a team like Hawthorne, it's actually one of those things where – they were strong in both defence and attack. And to be a successful premiership team, you need to be. Um, and again, if you had the time over again, you might work on your defensive part of the game a lot, a lot more because, you know, I think that's what wins grand finals in the end. We we ran forward of the ball very well, but we didn't run the other way as well as we should have. Um, we probably needed it. Like Tim Darcy is a really good friend of mine and he was a great player at Geelong. He'd be a great halfback flanker, but unfortunately, he had to play fullback a lot on the big guys, on Lockett and Dunstall and, and these guys. He and he was certainly not as big as those guys. So we probably needed a big, another big defender, but also just it starts from the forward line back. If the forward line and myself I'm included in that, if we show defensive um, skills, it flows through the, the, the game. So yeah, look, it was it was great fun. It was it was a great way to play footy, but. You live and learn when you play the big times in the big games. Barry, in the second half comeback, you were just kicking goals nonstop pretty much. And it, like lots of people thought you were going to win. Uh, how much was it playing in your mind? Uh, it could have been like one of the greatest grand final comebacks ever during the game. <laughs> yeah, not, 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 not during the game. I mean, certainly, um, yeah, obviously, now you sit back and think, gee, it would have been if, if we won. But the result's still the same, unfortunately, 32 years later. But um, it, it's one of those things where, you know, as a game goes on, you, see, you know you're getting closer. But I think the last the, the last thing you want to need to do and should do is to think about the result and the outcome because if you start thinking that, the game will get away from you. So we were just hell-bent on trying to get the next goal, the next kick, the next next clearance. And, and if we did that and stuck to the process and stuck to our game plan and know the way we can play um, – you know, it should take care of itself. So, yeah, look, you knew you were getting closer, but I, I know I didn't. I don't think the team did either. Never thought about, geez, if we win this, it would be the great, greatest comeback. It's just one of those things where we knew the Hawks were tiring and for, for different reasons, obviously. We, we were tiring as well. We probably had fitter players on the ground. And I suppose that, once again, that adrenaline rush at the start of the game, it was coming back in the last quarter because the crowd also could feel – Hawk Geelong coming back and getting closer. And they probably thought more about, wow, this could really happen. So you felt that you felt that energy in the crowd. And I think once you as a as a player, once you do hear that, you sort of get that second, third, fourth win. Um, so we certainly uh, kept on going until until the end to the last second. Um, but we didn't really I, I never thought of the outcome until obviously the siren blew. So, Andy, late in the game, there was a moment on about halfway of the field where Geelong were coming into attack and you, a pack, went up and you went in behind and grabbed the ball. How important was that for you? <laughs> every every moment, you know, my, my role um, was more of a defensive role in the grand final. Um, Barry, uh, you know, Robert Scott was had, a, had kicked many goals throughout the final sk- series. Um, so... Uh, I wasn't personally at 100% physically going into that game. So my job was, you know, to make sure – or I took my role as to make sure that he didn't score that day. So um, 
as the game went on, I believe that Robert went higher and higher up the ground and that allowed me to protect and guard a little bit more support around um, the, the crumbing ball down with Gary. Now, Gary was marking everything that day um, and there wasn't a lot of crumbing footy. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, at that particular moment um, to to take that, you know, and that that's the way, as I said, the mindset was that we had to keep going. And, you know, we if you look back, you know, um, and we didn't think this at the time, but, if you did an audit of the Hawthorne footballers, you've got Dermot now who's really suffering, but he has to be out there and because we've got no one on the bench. In those days, there was only two on the bench. And you've got Dipper who's really struggling. Like, you know, in any any other game, you've got Johnny Platten thinking that he's uh, in a picnic in uh, – <laughs> um, Charles Park or the Melbourne Zoo or something, you know. Um, so, and then Gary just, Gary Ayres couldn't come back on the ground, you know. So so we're, we're a little bit of a mess, but, you know, we had still running our legs, you know, James Morrissey, Dean Anderson, Darren Pritchard, Anthony Condon, they, these guys were still going. And, and you know, the forward line of Gary Ablett uh, was just, Amazing, you know, and you know Barry and and Billy, they're all really dangerous players. So, um, in the last couple of minutes, and what I recall, you know, personally, is that I'm pretty sure that we we sort of got a little goal, maybe at around the two or three minute mark. So I, I haven't seen the game for a while, so I'm just, you know, um, thinking that we got maybe a about eleven or twelve point margin, um, and then Geelong scored. And they were all of a sudden within one kick. And uh, and that must have been how long, Barry, do you think, a minute or two to go? Yeah, actually, uh, even probably nearly less than a minute, I think, because I remember David Cameron had a kick on goal, a set shot on goal, um, about 35 metres out. And again, I, I watched it a long time ago, and you sort of think, hurry up, hurry up, because you're watching the replay. Um, but he didn't know at the time, but it would have been probably nearly less than a minute. Um, when the centre bounce after that goal kick when we were goal behind. Could have been 30 seconds. And that So um, that was the last goal of the game. And that, that's when I got nervous. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, we hear about, as non-professional or non-top-level players, uh, we hear about the big team lifting courageous moments a lot in commentary and in the media from ex-players. And one that uh, springs to mind for me, close to the end of the game, Dipu's got... Um, his ribs are stuffed and his lungs are punctured and um, he dives in to a tackle to stop the Cats going forward with seconds to go, I think. And he, he could have been really, really badly hurt in that tackle specifically. And I, I guess those team lifting moments happens for both teams in most games. But do those? how much do those actually lift the team up or is it a bit of a media myth? Oh, uh, no, they're, they're very very dynamic motivational moments still and uh, so and you acknowledge those as teammates you know and and that's one of the great things that both teams you know would would talk about you know that if you see something like that it's probably a reminder that it's when it's your turn you better go and and that's a, a contract nearly amongst teammates and that that's what happens when the two best teams come out to play at their best that day, that those moments are throughout the game. And that moment with that individual, um, you know, that's terrific. And Dip will tell you that was an awesome moment and he'll tell you, you know, he had 20 or 30 awesome moments in that grand final and he'll tell you that he's he had 40 broken ribs and even though the body doesn't have that many, um, <laughs> both punctured lungs, you know, so, you know, but we, we really um, – you know, just take that moment when any of us uh, are called upon, and and I'm sure Barry would say the same. You know that it we don't we don't get um, inspired by every moment that we see, but there is a reminder that it's a contract and a contract that we adhere to within within us. That when it's your turn, you go. Yeah, I agree with that, and I think also. I mean, any game is the same, but the big ones, there's nowhere to hide, especially on grand final day. And um, 
if you if it is your time to go in these big games, you're right, you go 100. percent But but seeing that certainly the dipper, I recall that very clearly as well, and also Dermot at the start of the game, the start and the finish of the game with Dermot and, and Dipper, and what they did in the courageous acts goes a long way to winning the game. And, you know, we, as we said, Dermot, the whole situation is folklore and what, stuff of legend sort of stuff, but how he came back, got back and got, and got a goal, and then Dipper's tackle towards the end when he was, you know, in, in a bad way, that epitomises and depicts how good Hawthorne were um, and, and how strong they were in character and body. So you're right, Andy. I think whenever you have a chance to go for the ball and you, you know your teammates are there, that they're behind you, you just got to put your head down and, and go for it because if you don't, people know and you let the team down pretty quickly. So, Andy, siren goes. You've won by six points. Is it more relief that you didn't let Geelong win or just straight up jubilation? There is a jubilation, but there is there is a relief, and uh, and that's people are surprised with that. You know that each one of the grand final victories, there is a relief and, a, and an outlet that w- we achieved it, you know, and uh, for all the hard work. So there was a relief and then all of a sudden from there probably, you know, 10, 20 seconds later, there's this great smiles and, and we've done it and the acceleration um, comes through and, you know, that's a, that's a really special moment for every player. Now... You know, Barry talks on the other side of four grand finals and one thing I want to correct Barry on, like Geelong were a great team during that that tenure and that's the smallest of margins. You know, one will have a medal and one won't or one will hold up the cup and one won't. But, you know, that that's the sadness as well. And all these years on there's great empathy too. You know, and and here I am talking to an old foe, but also an old friend, saying, "Mate, I wish that he had experienced that. He deserved that." And so many great players in the history of the game deserve to uh, feel a premiership cup on grand final day, have a premiership medallion. But that's what makes the game so special. Not everyone can have that moment, and so when you do have it, and and Hawthorne were back to back premiers, and. It was quickly we knew what a special game it was. Um, unfortunately, not everyone was able to do the lap of honour. I think Dipper went straight down into the rooms, you know. Um, I think Dermot might have went straight back in the rooms. John still, you know, it's legendary that John doesn't know where he is. And Gary, you know, was, wasn't moving very well. So, um, but the celebrations were, were still there um, that night. It was probably... Even better because Dipper wasn't there that night, and uh, we're able to celebrate <laughs> without uh, celebrating Dip. But uh, it, you know, it, it was it was a really special moment, and that's that's a every per- player that plays in a grand final relief. Then then it really is about celebration. Barry, uh, just a few hours after the game, you head back to Geelong. You're greeted by thousands of fans, and I think mm. uh, I've heard that they they were pretty. Um, supportive and they're like, oh, you guys done so well to get there and you're so close. Does that lift you up from the – I guess you're feeling pretty down after the game, but does that help lift you up? Uh, oh, look, you're right. It was, uh, it was amazing, really. And to this day, it's still um, – it's hard to believe, to be honest. I mean, the support throughout your whole career of Geelong supporters and like any club is immense and Geelong town certainly – they did get sick of us losing grand finals after the fourth one. There was no one in the streets watching us. We're welcoming us home. But after the 89 one, we did get back to City Hall. It would have been, I don't know, 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And I, I recall really clearly walking out on the balcony and you couldn't see – all you could the furthest point away, you could just see people. So I couldn't tell you the amount of people who were there. It, would, it could have been 30,000 people in the street. And they're actually clapping and cheering. And we thought, hang on, we, we actually lost the game. Um, and not, we weren't having a go at them, but we just thought, this is, imagine if we had won it. So it certainly gave it, so it gave us a bit of, a little bit of, I suppose, pride in a way, in a funny sort of way, although we lost, that, that the supporters appreciated how far we got. But it still didn't actually um, help us or me uh, with that burning sort of desire to win. 
Um, you know, and, and you sort of when you're younger as well, you always think, oh, we'll come back out next year and we're we'll there again. Doesn't happen that way. And I think maybe, and this is just my thought, 30 years later, that when we did get back to City Hall and we were clapping and pats on the back and cheering, that maybe we sort of thought subconsciously that over the summer that, yeah, we'll get there again, uh, we'll be fine. Uh, and ironically, we missed the finals in 1990. So there's a lot of learnings in that. And one of those things was that, to know that yeah, the town completely support the club and the players. Um, the feeling we had straight after the game was just one of we were just demoralised uh, and just gutted. Um, but you're right when you when you walk out uh, to the the door in fans who clap and cheer, you do get a smile on the face and, and a thank you for supporting us. But again, it still burns away even many years later that we didn't quite get there. But again, as a if I was an observer of a footy game and. I watched it. If I, uh, as a neutral supporter, Geelong Hawthorne Grand Final to me was one of the best, if not the best, game apart from the result that has ever been around. Yeah, so I was just about to ask that. You guys might be a bit biased, but do you reckon it is the best, best Grand Final of all time? Well, I, I think. Well, again, a bit of bias. There's some these are amazing Grand Finals over the years, but it's up there with the best of them. There's no doubt because I don't think any at the start of the podcast that it had everything, 20 goals plus for both teams. It was really, really tough and relentless. It was very skillful and it was very close. So I think it was certainly up there with, with the best of them um, over many, many years. And uh, one day I'll probably sit down and watch the whole game just to remind myself of it, how good it was. Um, so I think it certainly is up there with the top two or three. Yeah, and and now I'm, I'm coaching and uh, during the, uh, the lockdown – I believe they replayed the game, and uh, yeah, I think I might have been watching something else on TV. But I, I received texts from the young players that I now coach, and they said, "What a hell of a game!" And that that's, you know, makes me proud that the game was a great spectacle. Um, that we were involved. Here we are. You know, the two of us were involved in what what is thought to be, you know. Um, the greatest game of all time. And that's for others to judge. Um, but, you know, definitely there's a pride, I think, from both teams that we're able to put an amazing display of footy on. And, you know, it was an incredibly bruising encounter. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, we laugh at it. Um, you know, I look at some, some incidents that occurred in that game and uh, we had a back-to-back reunion Um, So it gave us a chance to look at some of the highlights as a group. Um, I think between the Geelong and Hawthorne players, there would have been enormous amounts of suspensions. I don't think anyone got reported out of that grand final. (laughs) And yet on the the modern day, there was probably about 40 weeks of uh, incidents um, to be had. Um, But, you know, that's the way the game was played and uh, um, fierce foes, but great admiration for each other at the end. And I think the measure of the game as well is that we're still talking about it. And wherever you go, to this day, people still talk about the you play in the 89 grand final. So to me, that says, yeah, it's, it's still well-renowned. As Andy said, the, the young guys who he coaches watched it and thought how good it was. Um, and people who I work with sometimes bring it up, who are younger than I am. So to me, that means that must be one of the best ever because people still talk about it to this day. And it's 1989, I mean, 2020. Amazing. Do you guys think that that was a good way to end the VFL era, moving into the AFL era where the change of game might have come into play? Uh, if, I, if I recall, you know, that the, the expansion, um, you know, transferred the name from VFL to AFL, um, I feel like we had some interstate clubs, my history on that, in 1989, there still might have been, I think West Coast were already in yeah. at that particular time mm-hmm. um, and Sydney were definitely up there. So, you know, the branding change and that's why, you know, players like myself and Barry that played VFL, AFL, I think it was a really clever branding that probably should have occurred as soon as we had interstate teams. Um, so the game didn't change just because of a branding change. The game definitely changed 
you know, because of rule changes, the way the game was adjudicated, um, more interchange, you know, there, there's subtle movements of the game, you know, throughout the history. And, and unfortunately we can't go back, um, but we, we probably need to tweak it a little bit so we, we get a more free-flowing game. Now, you know, goodness knows wiser people than my pay grade is allowed have debated this, but that's, again, what makes that game so good to look at. Mm. What do you think, Barry? Yeah, no, yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly, and certainly um, with the introduction of the new brand of AFL uh, and all the other interstate teams coming into it, it certainly obviously took on a, on a broader spectrum and on a wider range of teams. And now uh, we we uh, played the Eagles uh, in '92 and '94 in the grand finals. I know we're a state team. There's no doubt when Andy and I were lucky enough to play state footy um, in that sort of time period against WA in South Australia and. Playing against the Eagles in those years was like a fully fledged um, state team, and they were really strong. But I, I know I agree with anybody who said that, that last week regarding the game. I, I, it's the last thing I want to be known as, which I'm not anyway, to be one of those old fossils who complain about the current game. But I still like the game, I love the game, I uh, still watch the game, and admire greatly the players and their fitness levels and their skill level. However, um, it's just. Somehow they're going to try and, I suppose, get a bit of that attacking flair back, which which we saw in 89. I'm not saying to that extent because it's a different game, but that's what people want to see is the goals and the, the high marks and the attacking footy with also a defensive element. So that's the challenge that the, the greater beans have other than me. So, guys, I think that just about wraps us up in terms of grand final specific chat. But in the, uh, in the last little segment of our podcast um, – all the listeners will know we like to do a little quiz. Uh, so we like to relate it a bit to our guests and, in your case, the 89 Grand Final. Usually do five questions, but special edition, we're, we're going 10 questions. Make it a bit longer. Uh, spice it up a bit. So um, it's just um, – will be Andy and Jackson and Barry. So your name is your buzzer. And, yeah, I'll start with question one. So uh, I think you guys know there was a Batgirl streaker at that game. Uh, and it was just a day after the Batman movie, directed by Tim Burton, had been released. But can you tell me two other films that Tim Burton has directed? Andrew. Go for it. <laughs> it's a tough question first up. <laughs> Edward Scissorhands. And oh, I will go with Tim Burton. Another one, Alice in Wonderland. Correct. One point. Wow. One point to Andrew. So, good start. Um, you a big fan of his movies? Loved Edward Scissorhand. Didn't mind Alice in Wonderland. And I, I've forgotten the one about the tree. There was another one. Um, Edward. Really... So, Andy, you have kids and Andy, I'll take it. Yeah, I love movies. <laughs> but you, you have kids? You have children? Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, well, he's got some other fairly big name movies. He's got um, Planet of the Apes, and he, he just did uh, Dumbo. Uh, I think it was a live, well, not a live action, but it was. I think it was meant to look like the real elephant, you know, uh, like just last year. Uh, so yeah, one point to Andrew. Question two. So Hawthorne Geelong, uh, we've there, you've had a few players play for both clubs, uh, some big names, and but can you tell me three players? who have been on the senior playing list of both clubs in their career. Andrew. Barry. Andrew oh, just oh. snuck in. I want to mention Austin McCrabb. <laughs> <laughs> Big shout out to Austin. I just, I just wanted to say Austin because he's a, he's a ripper bike, Barry, isn't he? You know? Fantastic, yes. Enigma, yeah. Austin McCrabb. Um, and obviously Gary was on both uh, yep. Hawthorne, Hawthorne list and – I just wanted to say Gary Ablett again as well. Um, and Austin and Gary were, were very close uh, at different times. Now, the third one, I, I would say Lord, Aaron, Law, uh, yes. Aaron Lord. Aaron Lord, correct. And um, some other notable ones. Uh, you've got uh, Tim Hargreaves, David Lotes, uh, Kevin Ablett, Calvin Matthews, uh, Sam Menegola was on the list at Hawthorne. Was he? Hawthorne, yeah, okay. Yeah, and I think he was at another club before Geelong. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Yes, correct. I think he was in their, on their list as well, or rookie list or something. Yeah, yeah. And um, Jonathan Simpkin as well. Uh, he played for Essendon as a top-up player 
uh, when they had a few players suspended a few years ago. So, uh, yeah, 2-0 two, two to Andrew. Good start. Uh, so question three. Uh, this one is not so related to the game, uh, but can you tell me which singer most famously sings these lyrics? I need love, love. Oh, ease my mind. And I need to find time, someone to call mine. Oh, yeah. Uh, my <laughs> mama said, you can buzz in at any time. My mama said, you can't hurry, love. No, you'll just um, have to wait. She said. See, I know the, I know the song. I'm singing it to myself as, I, as, I go, as you're going. Love don't come easy, but it's a game of give and take. Come on, Barry, I'm giving you this one. <laughs> Do you know the singer? No, no, Ready? not at all. I know the song. I know the uh, song too. Uh, uh, yeah, we're both humming. We shouldn't hum on our <laughs> or po- I can't think, I can't this think of This guy's a drummer as well. He's their drummer. He, he does drums and he sings as well. He's well Bill Collins. Bill Collins is correct. Hey, right, so yeah. We, yeah, we Sorry, like I the, should have said Andrew. <laughs> yeah. Andrew first. Sorry, I didn't get the buzzer. <laughs> Do right. I get that point? Could be, yeah, could you do get that <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we like to. Don't hurry, love. It's Phil Collins. Phil Collins, yeah. Collins, Andrew Collins, bit of a link. Yeah, there, he's, yeah. he's related. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> question four. Uh, I think we all know about the Kennet curse, do we? The uh, um, big streak of games where Geelong beat Hawthorne after the 08 grand final. So, but can you tell me how many games did they Barry. get cur- Go for it, Barry. I've got to get in somehow. Um, <laughs> ten? Ten is incorrect. Mm. How many games did it last? Anyone else? It's uh, not closest to the pin. You've got to get exact. Jackson, uh, 13. 13 is incorrect as well. Mm. Well, I'm, I get a free hit. <laughs> free hit. Go for it. I want to say it was 14. It was 11. Mm. Oh, 11. Round 1, 09 to round 15, 2013. And a lot of those games, classics, really close games. I'm sure we all remember them. Uh, we'll move on to question five. Can you get nearest the pin for that one? <laughs> no, well, we've got that for a question coming up. Uh, so question five. Uh, Nancy Kerrigan was born in Stoneham, Massachusetts. Can you tell me who Nancy Andrew. Kerrigan is? But, yeah. Go for it, Andrew. Tonya Harding. What about it? She Barry. she, she uh, chopped her legs, <laughs> belted her. Yeah, correct. Oh, <laughs> her brother. Her yeah. brother did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, figure, famous figure skater. What Olympics was it? 90, 96, something like that. Was that an exponent, bonus point? No, I'm not going to give no you the bonus. answer unless there's a bonus point involved. <laughs> no bonus point I'm not, involved. I'm, I'm still not very competitive. competitive. Did you say what does she do? <laughs> yeah, well, um, so, yeah, four – for nothing to Andrew. This is, yeah. uh, oh, I think, mate. on the last uh, podcast or maybe two podcasts ago, Jackson lost 8 0 <laughs> to Scott McDonald. So it's not looking good for him. But uh, we'll move on to <laughs> question six. So uh, the players that finished first, second, and equal third in the Brownlow in 89 all played in the grand final. Name those three players Andrew. All played in the grand final. Andrew, go for it. It's on a roll. Well, we, we know Couchy. Couchy, yep, yep of course. Uh, in 89, Johnny Platton was still playing great footy. Is that an answer? Yes, I'll go with John Platton. <laughs> yeah, John Platton's also correct. And the third one, just uh, – and I, I would think that he kicked a lot of goals and he, he polled always a lot of votes but never really got uh, the brown low is Jason Dunstall. Jason Dunstall's okay. correct. Yes. Genius, and wow. he, uh, Jason Dunstall Wait, equal third. Was, was Gary Hocken up there at all? Was he? Uh... Uh, I haven't got the full list, but I know uh, Jason Dunstall was equal third with okay. Tim Watson and uh, Nicky Winmar. But yeah, I think Gary Hocking was up there in the, in around the top ten. I think when I had a look yeah. earlier. Um, so moving on to question seven, we got close. Five zip. Yeah, five zip exactly. Uh, hey, come back now. <laughs> this is the hard That's time. Right. <laughs> Alan <laughs> Jeans is just giving us to pay the price, mate. <laughs> <Yeah>. I'm injured. <laughs> it's up to you now, mate. <laughs> Barry, you know what to do. Um, so question seven, closest to the pin. So the grand final, September 30, 1989. In a non-leap year like 1989 is, was, what number day of the year is September 30? What? So January 1st is the first day of the year and January 28th is the 28th day of the year. What number day of the year is September 30? January 1... 
This is in a non-leap year. Remember. All right, that's nine months. I'm, I'm just taking a mathematical guess. Nine times three is 27, 270 days. 270 days. Anyone else want to go in? Just to go. No, I'll say in a non-leap year. Uh, Jackson, do you want I'll, to I'll buzz in now. 268. Oh. 268, Jackson? I'll try and buzz in to 271. <laughs> 273, so Jackson's got a point. Oh, we're going near, oh, nearest <laughs> yeah. the Are you with me, Jackson? That's good. We're one on the board. Yes, good stuff, we're on. Huh? You guys can I'll give you that one. <laughs> You'll team up. You'll team up. Uh, so question eight. Uh, that game, last of the VFL era, as we mentioned before, so since 1990, the AFL era, which team has won the most premierships and how many have they won? Barry. Barry. Oh, let me think about this. Oh. <laughs> I have to buzz you out if you take too long, though. Uh, okay. Okay, okay. Let's say Hawthorne. And how many? I'll say five. Spot on. Hawthorne with five premierships, uh, 91, uh, 08, and 13, 14, 15, the three-peat a few years ago. A few years ago. Uh, so moving on to question nine, I think Andrew's on five, are you? And Jackson and Barry both on one. But I think we know the who am I question coming up. It could be a comeback. Uh, so question nine. Many significant things happened in 1989. So you've got archaeologists unearthing a 4,400-year-old mummy of an aristocratic young Andrew. <laughs> Tutankhamen. Tutankhamen's not correct. Oh. Oh, this is the question, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get in early. <laughs> Got to get in early. <laughs> <laughs> We're on here, Barry. Uh, also... <laughs> <laughs> also, the birth of Taylor Swift, which may be related to that aristocratic one, young woman, we don't know. Uh, so, also that year, the Berlin Wall went down. But what year did the Berlin Wall go up? I'll give you a multiple choice. Is it A, 1945, B, 1953, C, 1961, or D, 1972? Collo, because I've got a, a nickname as well, so I can use both names. You've got to wait. You've got to wait for the other two buzzy in before. All right. Okay. I was going to use another alias. All. 1972. Uh, 1972 is not correct. Jackson, do you want to go for it? Or B. I'm going to go for B. B, 1953 is also incorrect. Uh, right in the middle, 1961. So it was up for 28 years. Um, but our last question... Uh, there's a chance for both Barry and Jackson here because our last question is a who am I question where we'll go down from five points all the way down to one point with a series of clues and you've just got to buzz in and once you've buzzed in, you can't buzz in again until everyone else has got it wrong. So I'll start um, for the five-point clue. For five points, I'm a footballer who was born on the 13th of September 1967, Aussie rules footballer. Shall I move on? No one looks likely. I think I'll move on to the four points. <laughs> uh, for four points, I played 226 games and I was born in Devonport, Tasmania. You could both go for the draw here, Jackson and Barry. If you want to get it on the four-pointer, take a punt. Does anyone want to give it a go? No. Uh, Jackson? Oh, Jackson. Is it Peter Hudson? Peter Hudson's incorrect, I'm afraid. Oh. Bye-bye, <laughs> uh, Jackson, I think. Andy's wishing you um, <laughs> for three points. I kicked 426 goals in my career and I'm my club's fourth all-time leading goal kicker. Barry, do you want to have a stab or Andy? I think Andy's one uh, now, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> I'll let Jackson back in as well. Oh, yeah, Jackson, tell me. Thanks, team nice. effort. I've, I've just brought myself to the bench because the game's won. <laughs> I'm just sitting there just uh, – <laughs> Do you know how it is? No, I, I don't. Like I'm, I'm thinking 50, 53, 53, Tasmanian. Um, you know, initially I was going to say Pritch, you know, he's, I think he's 54. So – and then – so who do we play against – Tasmanian footballers, Barry, in our era. Yeah, they were goal kickers. Fourth, fourth, fourth highest in the 
club's history. Yeah. 53 years old. I'll tell you the link between it. It's not much of a link, but uh, it's the average of – he played 226 games, and that's the average of what you two play, played combined. That's not much of a clue, but <laughs> there you go. Uh, no, next clue. Okay, I'll move on right. for the uh, two-point clue. Uh, I won my club's best and fairest uh, in 1990 and 1994, which was called the Keith Bluey Truscott Medal. And I'm a current prominent media performer. Current? In both TV and radio. <laughs> Maybe a bit of newspaper work as well. Uh, that's terrible. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Do you know which club is awards the, um, the Keith Bluey Truscott Medal? That's what I was team? trying to figure out. I, I was, I'm thinking Melbourne, but I could be wrong. I can't tell you, but if you want to have a guess, you can go for it. There's been a lot of blueies at the Western Bulldogs. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> Bluey Truscott. Yeah. That's terrible. I should know my sport of the No. I can move it on if no one wants yeah, to buzz in. Yeah, go ahead. For the one point, uh, I've got a current Australian test cricketer nicknamed after me. Jackson. Jackson. Gary Lyon. I think someone might be at the doorbell there. I- <laughs> oh, it's Matthew Wade. Nice, Gary. Gary Lyons, correct. Well done, Jackson. But I'm afraid it's too little, too late. Uh, five points to Andy, two points to Jackson, and one point to Barry. So, can we have a round of applause for Andy, please? <laughs> too good, Andy. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Yeah, I just like second place. Apparently. <laughs> yeah. Well, second place not too bad against a couple of um, greats of the footy. Great to have AFL and VFL. So uh, I think that just about wraps us up. So massive thanks, boys, for coming on. Gave us so much time. So much appreciated. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. Boys, really, really enjoyed it. And it was great speaking to you again, Barry. And I hope our paths uh, cross soon, mate. It'd be good Absolutely, to see Andy. Other. Thanks, yeah. Great to chat, boys. Really good. Great to actually reminisce about that year and also the, 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 the past years, the, the glory days, as we say. But, yeah, thanks very much for your time. Appreciate it. And thanks, Andy. Pleasure. All the best. You too. And we're back. How good was that, Harps? Oh, what a great episode. That was just so good to chat to some, in the studio, some players who were playing that legendary game and the author of that great book, Tony Wilson. And remember, if you want to win the book, go back a bit into the podcast. If you haven't heard it already, I just need a reminder, you can win a free copy of the 1989, The Great Grand Final. It's a great book, well worth a read. So um, what's our outro topic for today, Jackson? So we're not, because this this has been a huge podcast already, we're not going to go into our favourite, but it's our the best games of all time because this is one of the best games if not grand finals of all time so send us in we're going to post on our socials write some answers and we'll maybe talk about it on the next one yeah exactly our socials all in the show notes below so check them out and uh i think we're going to do something a bit new this week we're going for, we're going to try to get the name out there of some new up-and-coming music artists so there's a friend of the show that we've got on we've got a girl called shanae ibrahim she's uh, only about 16 or 16, 17, and um, she's recorded and written her own song. Uh, it's called I Deserve Better. So we're going to have a listen to this, check her out. She's going to be a great, great musician in the future. So here it is, I Deserve Better.
Oh. 